recording. Fantastic. Okay. Well, um, thank you everybody for, for joining us. Um, before we get on to our main event, I'll just do a few announcements. So um, thank you everybody who's who's come and who everybody who would join offline. Um, today marks the sort of start of the, the Riot Science Club at uh, the University of Westminster. Uh, for those who don't know what the Right Science Club is, what I will just quickly do is show you and just do a brief intro of who we are. Oh, there is a new CV, Ian, for my announcement later. So uh, you can find us on Twitter and our website uh, where we post all sort of relevant information uh, about what we, who we are and, and upcoming events. But... Um, Westminster is really thrilled to be part of the sort of growing number of, of right science clubs. And we just put on uh, weekly uh, seminars, workshops, demos and stuff like this. And um, we've got several sites now, mainly in the UK, but also increasingly in uh, uh, on the continent as well. And you can find all of our content on our YouTube channel. And please like and subscribe and do all the rest of it so you can keep up to date and as well and you can also find us on uh, Twitter as well so we have the main sort of page uh, here and you can follow us there or you can also find the Twitter pages for all of the different sites as well and here we post links uh, that allow you to to join us uh, and anybody can join providing they have an internet connection it's completely free open uh, anyone, whether you're an academic or not, can join. Um, I think that is all of the announcements. The only other thing to cover is the upcoming speakers. Hopefully you can see all of that. So we've already had two speakers this semester, um, one at the Durham Wright Science Club and one at King's College London, uh, and they are on YouTube now. And this week we have a speaker today, Ian Hussey, and tomorrow we have uh, Dr. Charlotte Pennington, who will be giving a talk for the, the Norway Riot Science Club site. OK, so I'm going to sh stop sharing and then sort of get on to the main event. So um, first of all, thank you very much, Ian, for, for joining us today. Um, Ian. I've known him for a while now on Twitter, and I'm sure you have as well. He's uh, he's always there with a, a ready-made sort of snark comment or a very insightful criticism of uh, science or research more broadly. Um, but for those who don't know him or have lives outside Twitter, um, I'll just do a quick sort of walkthrough of his uh, CV that he has kindly put on his website, so it's easy for me. But uh, he did a BA in psychology at Maynooth University, uh, where he also got a, a PhD as well. And then he took a postdoc position at uh, Ghent University in Belgium. And his research mainly focuses on all sorts of things from um, mainly in the sort of uh, the measurement and the prediction of hard to sort of purchase things such as implicit bias or suicidal behavior. Um, I know him from his really brilliant work in sort of improving reproducibility and transparency of research, particularly in uh, in measurement. And uh, he's done all sorts of great sort of uh, sort of codes and scripts that you can use as well. And I found his stuff on examples of meta analyses particularly useful. And for all of his efforts, he was given the the SIPS Commendation uh, Award in 2019. And today he's going to talk about um, theory building, I guess, and his comments on, on that, which if you came to a neuroskeptics talk last week, he touched on the idea of this sort of interpretability crisis, which is maybe the next phase in this, this crisis of replication, reproducibility and so on. And a part of that is obviously theory building and, and how do you interpret your findings and so on. So... I'm going to hand the keys over to you, Ian. Uh, thank you again. Do you want to just start sharing your screen before I mute and, and give you the full stage? Perfect. OK, over to you, Ian, and thanks again. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure how to feel that 
the very first descriptor of me is snarky on Twitter. Uh, it's probably quite accurate, but uh, I'll have to ruminate on that one later. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about how the best theory, in my opinion, is a flawed one. Um, I should say that I'm giving this talk not as a philosopher of science, uh, but a user of it. So, uh, you know, there are probably people who I have said things like this before that I, I failed to cite so far. This is, this is a building... Um, uh, interest in mine right now. So perhaps it's a little rough. Uh, I'll give you the standard opener on this, that uh, psychology is a science in crisis, a replication crisis, a measurement crisis, a generalizability crisis, a theory crisis, um, an interpretability crisis, apparently. I haven't caught uh, neuroskeptics talk just yet. I think it gets described in these breathless terms for the last 10 years, um, but it also really depends who you ask. Either uh, we really are in a state of abject crisis, or it's been like this forever because people have been saying this for decades, um, that this is just the way that science proceeds and that uh, some sciences deal with it better or worse. And others seem to want to just continue on uh, as of normal and have uh, done a great job of ignoring any of this and just doing what they've always done. But I think what I find um, at first, funny and then thought provoking are takes like Richard Morey's and um, that we eventually will be in a, a crisis crisis where we run out of crises to have. Um, this is funny. I liked the take. I like takes on Twitter, but I think it still raises an important, it skewers an important thing that the, the crisising, the crisisology of Twitter is still, is, is there for a reason because crises um, they get people going, they capture attention, they're a call to action, uh, that something must be done and now. Uh, there's an urgency to them. And I think that they're fascinating uh, on that level, the idea of a crisis as something that motivates people to act. Um, and I suppose I see it in the context of the meme, which everyone and their mother has heard of these days, but I think fewer people think back to the original construction of the concept um, from Richard Dawkins, who has become much more of a pain in the arse in the last uh, few years, but, but used to have great things to say. So a meme is a cultural unit, an idea, a behavior, a style, it's very broad, and it propagates through variation, mutation, competition, and inheritance. It is effectively evolutionary theory applied to symbolic phenomena. And I think that the invocation of the concept of crisis is exactly this. Um, I should say, to take a step back, that this all comes from what I think is a fairly coherent worldview that informs everything I do and generally my interest in science uh, writ large, um, which is a coherent worldview based on the core concept of selection by consequence, which is evolutionary theory applied to all levels of what we do, from biology, genetics and epigenetics, to uh, behavior, I'm originally a behaviorist, and symbolic behavior, which includes language, culture, and uh, the human uh, highly verbal, high co highly cognitive life that most of us think of. This is, uh, I think, fascinating work um, as an aside, you know, contributed to by people like B.F. Skinner, uh, Vijablonska, and Harari, most of which, apart from Sapiens, which was a New York Times bestseller, um, is not talked about that much. And I think that this is fascinating in the exactly the opposite way to what to um, the concept of a crisis being invoked is fascinating because crises are invoked to get us to act whether we are or are not in a crisis. It has minimal truth value, or it's rather its truth value is irrelevant. And these theories, I think, are true in my opinion, but they're not. They're overlooked. So I think that there's an interesting dissociation between truth value and something being a good story. And I think that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> so what is, is this talk not, perhaps deceptively based on its title? It's not a discussion of what a good theory is for us as humans and as scientists and researchers. For this, I would point you to maybe uh, Iko Fried's excellent target article and excellent series of um, replies to it in um, Psych Inquiry published a year or two ago, 
Um, really excellent um, series of things if you want to read on the, the varieties of uh, what theory is and isn't to different people in psychology. I think it's interesting to just pull out one single sentence, sorry I go to reduce it down so much, to say, in summary, I believe that theories are for helping us to understand the world, which facilitates description, prediction, and control. And what I thought was um, not necessarily missing, but an entirely different view on what theory is, because this is all, all, of, the, all of the discussion contained in these special, uh, this target article and replies are matters of what is theory for us? And to turn this on its head and butcher the uh, JFK quote, um, I would say, ask not what your theory can do for you, but what you can do for your theory. This is a, a, a discussion I want to have on um, what are we doing for theories that allows them to be good or bad. Okay, so what is a good theory? From this uh, perspective of mine, at least, um, if we put truth and epistemology aside and just think of it in evolutionary terms, this may be unfamiliar to you if you don't have uh, behavioral uh, training. Um, I think it comes naturally to uh, those few of us um, who, who still do. I would say a good theory is one which survives. This is good for the theory. It's not necessarily good for us. It has to be talked about. It has to be debated and maintained because if it's merely in the pages of books, um, it is not living to, or surviving to the same extent. What is survival in this context? Again, irrelevant uh, truth value of the theory uh, or use value. It survives if it gets cited. That's the academic context we've uh, constructed. It survives if it gets funding, if it has impact in, in the sense of even mere public awareness. Um, I'll come back to implicit uh, attitudes research in a minute. That get, has now got cited in US presidential debates. I would say that theory is flourishing. It is a good theory insofar as it survives. It could have policy implications. And one of the key ones, it, it creates jobs for those who work within them and on them. Um, so it's better to think of theory in this context as a living entity not better in all contexts, just it is a way we could talk about it in a way that I don't think we have been talking about them enough. They are living entities, metaphorically. They compete for limited resources and they need to be talked about because to be discussed is to survive. This is a constant game of keepy up for them. Um, not to be talked about is to die off. So I'm gonna use um, an example, an abstract example, and then we're gonna come down to uh, a concrete one. I would like you to imagine that there are two theories. I'm going to use Futurama characters because I'm a fan. Um, a Farnsworth theory and a Wernstrom theory. And I'll come back to this, but these are labels I'm putting on theories, not individuals. <clears throat> these theories could be distinguished in the following way. A Farnsworth theory is highly precise. It has precise definitions. It makes very precise claims about what it is and isn't stating is the case. It has boundary conditions. It has constraints on generality. It has falsifiability built in, or it has a clear position on, on the role of theory and falsifiability for those who might disagree. It in, uh, uses severe tests of itself. So when assessing the, 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 the utility uh, or the, the truth of the theory, we, we test it as hard as we can rather than weakly or peripherally. And within that testing, we have good measurements um, and because of this, we, um, or rather in addition to this, we use a small, a very small number of large studies. We have limited resources. Um, so we choose to dedicate those to extremely large studies that test key client claims in a severe way with good measurement and self-replication, all the rest of it, all the good stuff that we're all told is good science. Feel free to add anything else to this list. Agnostic to whether the theory is true and thinking terms, in terms only of survival of this theory. Work is slow. It produces fewer publications. It takes years to do these multi-site, uh, this careful work on measurements before you start making um, domain level claims. You produce fewer publications, which you can uh, then use to a less effect to get yourself jobs or promotion. It is lower impact. 
in the sense of journal impact, maybe. It would have less funding, perhaps. And importantly, the aligned researchers are on average likely to get fewer jobs to continue them talking about the theory. In contrast, the Wernstrom theory is extremely vague. It uses colloquial language, concepts like um, awareness um, or consciousness, which sometimes have technical meanings and sometimes don't, or people disagree on their technical meanings. Um, it's like chemists talking about water instead of H2O. The first allows for all sorts of ambiguities. Um, its impact is implied rather than realized. So this would be huge if true, uh, with more emphasis on the huge if and less on the whether it is true. It, in testing it, we would test weak uh, tests of its peripheral claims rather than its core ones. We might indulge in things like uh, hypothesizing after results are already known, um, retreating to uh, auxiliary and rescue hypotheses. So um, uh, adding to the theory in some way when a key part of, uh, part of it is uh, undermined. I'll come back to this with examples. And we would generally use under uh, parrot studies. You can see where I'm going with this. Work is fast, there are many publications, um, there are high impact or merely implied high impact. We are only, uh, as I like to, to say to some of my friends, uh, we're only N years away from a real discovery here where N is about the length of my current grant. Um, I'll attract more funding, I'll get more aligned researchers to get more jobs. Generally, it will flourish. I think um, Futurama might say this better than I will, so I'll, I'll play this and hopefully everyone can hear. We might have to cut it out for the YouTube. Wernstrom, the very same. Dr. Wernstrom, do you save my city? Of course, but it'll cost you. First, I'll need tenure, done, and a big research grant. You got it. Also, access to a lab and five graduate students, at least three of them Chinese. D all right, done. What's your plan? What plan? I'm set for life. Au revoir, suckers. That rat, do something. I wish I could, but he's got tenure. Now that might sound cynical, um, but it does get to the point of what I'm saying. You can, and where you here is a theory. A theory can dodge ever really being tested, falsified, supported or not, as long as it can keep expanding and acquiring resources. It's really important that I reiterate though, that what I'm saying here is completely agnostic to researchers' intentions. It doesn't require any cynicism and no bad actors are necessary here, just between theory variation, competition and selection, just to keep the, the usual core properties of evolution, but in this case, apply to the theories. Wernstrom's here are theories, not theorists. So I'm not looking to take a pop at anyone. I'm not saying anyone is acting uh, personally, badly, I'm, I'm describing um, the selection of and proliferation of theories. So for the last 10 years, all of my academic career, uh, I've done a lot of work on implicit attitudes, on behavioral tasks, which without asking you directly, seek to measure um, and uh, measure beliefs that you might be unwilling or able to uh, self-report, or that's what's claimed. I think uh, these are an excellent, excellent theory. Completely agnostic to its truth value, I think these theories have um, expanded at crazy rates insofar as they pull in more funding, more citations, more discussion. We are now at the point where uh, pre US presidential debates invoke the concept. Hillary Clinton invoked it on the debate stage with Donald Trump. Uh, if I recall. Um, and uh, even we have even got to the point where satire articles get written about this. So a few years ago, uh, an article was published in Psych Science with a satirical accusation that it will be soon mandatory to include an implicit association test in every psychology study you ever run. So these things are big. And in that, in that regard, by my definition, they are good. Okay, implicit attitudes are not a single formal theory, 
but they can be treated as a general body of thought. Um, and they're defined by research that discusses, discusses behavior emitted within these so-called implicit measures. And in a measure, it tends to be implicit because we say that it is so. That's just the way that it goes. It's not a single body of thought. And I think this is good for the theory because it allows for variation. When, when they get it right, yeah, that's an implicit measure. When it doesn't work out, no, that's not. If you aren't aware of them, please you know, feel free to try one yourself. There's a link there. We try and maybe put it in the description on YouTube as well. Um, you can complete one online. The general, uh, the, the, the best known one is the implicit association test. Um, generally, the idea is that many are reaction time based, some are not. The general idea is that you categorize stimuli, for example, faces in the middle of the screen, and you categorize them with overlapping labels. In this case, uh, on the left hand side, you'll see African American and good, and you'll have to categorize them under time pressure. And then in a separate block of trials, um, the labels will swap. So it's then African American and bad. And reaction time biases or differentials are then inferred to represent implicit associations um, as a little background. What are the, the key claims here? And I think even as I was preparing these slides, I thought claims might not be uh, the right word because to say something is a claim might mean that the whole um, thing might fall if they weren't to be the case. It's more like uh, these are the uh, assertions that a field gets its momentum from talking about. They're more like talking points. Uh, they are not limited to these, but some that I'll talk about here are the idea that implicit measures measure unconscious associations. It's a fairly key, simple claim. Uh, that they are uniquely predictive of overt behavior, that they are reliable and valid measures, and that they are acquired via unconscious experience and some of the main names in the field. Um, not that it is about their specific claims, um, but rather the survival of the theory writ large. But these claims have been made in the literature by primary people. So where previously I threw out the Wernstrom Farnsworth examples as a generality here, let's think of it, this literature specifically, in terms of selection by consequence, generation of papers, citations, funding and jobs, how well might such a theory with these claims and these conditions survive? How good a theory is it? Okay. The claim or the talking point is implicit measures measure unconscious associations. Now, out of the gate, I find this one a tricky one because um, Greenwald and Lai in their recent um, uh, big, highly visible paper in Annual Review of Psychology open by saying, quote, implicit does not equal unconscious. And in one sense, surely we can just put it to bed and say, well, let's stop using that talking point because some of the key people say it's not the case. The problem is that not only between uh, papers by different authors or between papers by the same author, but even within papers by the same authors, you find slippage on key assertions like this, that uh, one paragraph will say, we all know implicit is not the same as unconscious, and then it will go on to talk about it as if it is the case. This has evoked enough um, uh, confusion and at times irritation that uh, others have written uh, papers just to explore this concept. Systematic reviews of how the, concept, the, the term implicit has been used. Does it refer to the measure? Does it refer to the uh, mental process being measured? Does it refer to the conditions under which it's uh, emitted? And so on. And there's generally no agreement. And Olivier uh, Cornell has done, uh, it's an excellent paper, check it out. But it doesn't matter that much. Because all of this gets into, is it true and not, are we now talking about it? From an are we now talking about it point of view, we are talking about it more. And I would argue that, as the counterfactual, that if the claim had been precise, less cool, um, at the get-go, we would be talking about it less now. The bolder claim that's not even necessarily stood over in all contexts serves to provoke more debate, which equals more citations and more dedication of funding. 
it helps the theory survive, making it, ironically, a better theory within this framework. Olivier would never have to write his paper on implicit what do you mean if the definition was clear from the get-go. So in this regard, this ambiguity is good for theory. More research necessary. Well, what do they measure? Do they measure unconscious associations? This itself could be interpreted in lots of different ways. Does it mean that, as Greenwald and Lai quote, uh, say in their introduction, that implicit measures measure something unavailable to self-report or introspection? Well, no, we've been known for years that people can accurately report uh, if they're likely to, when you simply ask people, do you think you'll score high or low on a race IT? They're pretty accurate with what they tell you. Um, maybe it's that these uh, attitudes are expressed at the time of expression without consciousness awareness. Also, no, we know from the effect, effect misattribution procedure, something I've written on, um, that uh, the degree of awareness almost entirely accounts for the, the, the effect on the task. Um, not to get, I'm not trying to get too into the weeds of any of these cases, but just to provide additional examples at each time. Is it perhaps then the case that what we really meant was that they are acquired without conscious awareness? No, I'll come back to that one. So how is the theory doing? You could at one say, on one level say it's taking a few knocks here because uh, variations of the claim keep, shown, keep being shown to not be the case. But seen through a selection by consequence lens, instead you can rephrase that as the theory is still being discussed. If they made a more precise, less ambitious claim at the start, none of these follow-up papers would ever have gotten written. No grant proposals would be sought to find the do, to do the work, and we wouldn't still be talking about this. It's good for the theory, and that makes it a good theory. What is it we're trying to even measure then? Is another question that could be asked within this field. Depending on who you ask, it's purely associative mental representations. It's purely propositional mental representations. It is a dual process representation involving other, sometimes with nesting, sometimes without nesting. Or who cares? Focus on the predictions. You could see this as disagreement within a field and disagreement that is hindering progress as we try to move towards truth, but only if you think that the goal here is to move towards truth. If the goal is for the theory, from the theory's perspective, from the th for the theory to survive, it's doing marvelously. It's being talked about in dozens of papers. There is variation and mutation uh, with, between and within theory and selection of ones that get cited more and less. And generally, we're feeding it resources. I do think it's still, I've highlighted Greenwald um, because I still think it's uh, interesting to note that the same people who made the core claim of what they measure also later say it doesn't matter what they measure. Um, so the, the, the discardability of the claims um, is worth noting. Um, okay, well, we can keep going. We can keep pushing it. Do they cause overt behavior? Surely we care about this. The implicit biases in my mind brain are the thing that made me act in a uh, undesirable racist overt behavior manner. Well, I think that would be, I and the literature as a whole apparently think that that would be a very dangerous claim to make. I almost never see the word cause in the literature because that is a specific technical and testable meaning. You can then demand um, an assessment of uh, causality. Um, uh, whereas if I simply say that these things guide behavior, drive it, that they can influence it or determine or shape it, I get all the benefits of the implication, the, 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 the layperson implications of that um, with a much lower risk of being, being disproved. So as long as I write paper after paper that says that these things guide overt behavior, I can dodge um, ever being tested as a theory. It's good for the theory. What about another core talking point? That these things are uniquely predictive of overt behavior, because that sounds cool. I was brought into this um, in the last year of my uh, bachelor's degree. I read a, 
a paper by Matthew Nock, uh, Nock 2010, which said that the suicide IoT could predict ahead of time individuals who were likely to uh, be readmitted for suicide attempts in the future, up to six months later. That was amazing. I, I will say that that effect has been replicated since. Um, and I think it's one of few kind of shining examples that there might actually something be something cool going on here. But claims like this suck people in. Is that, again, let's put aside the truth value of this. It doesn't matter whether Knox's claim is true or not. From a selection by consequence point of view, thinking of good theories as those who survive, that claim alone pulled me and others into this field to say, I'm going to put years of my time and apply for funding and, and win it and then spend it trying to assess these things. So uh, what are the outcomes of these assessments? Well, it depends who you ask. Are implicit measures uniquely predictive of over overt behavior? Yes, if you ask Greenwald at the start or very recently. Um, but effectively, no, if you ask Greenwald in the middle when he was... Um, tweaking the scoring algorithm used in the IAT. Um, sometimes um, is the, I think, generally accepted view now that there are moderation by other variables, such as social desirability and sensitivity, which I think is, is can come off as a Mott and Bailey argument. It's, it's to, to retreat to the, the weaker form of the argument once pressed. Um, and this is generally an issue we see in the replicability literature that an appeal to sometimes hidden moderators, in this case, credit to the literature for specifying which variables. So there are many studies on whether social desirability and sensitivity um, uh, moderate the relationship between implicit and explicit and implicit and behavioral uh, outcomes. Um, but not to get too into the weeds of it, the good theory is the one that survives and the good theory survives by a simple answers so saying sometimes is much easier than saying sometimes but maybe not because if you read greenwald and lies uh review of meta-analyses of this question the top line conclusion they make is yes it is moderated by social sensitivity and if you read the table they present it's actually mixed evidence a bunch of nulls and some positives, all meta-analyzing the same literature. So I think it's a very unanswered question. When uh, Olivier and I um, have looked at it ourselves, a work which is unfortunately still in prep, um, looking at around 10 times the number of participants in total than was ever used in the, com in the totality of the literature to date, we find a solid no, zero effect or negative effect. But it doesn't matter, it's good for the theory. A, meta, a review of meta-analyses contains hundreds of thousands of hours of work componentially. And it doesn't really matter what conclusion you reach because the talking point was out there anyway. It's good for the theory. What about being predictive over and above explicit measures? I think I might've mixed up the last uh, heading with this one. <clears throat> Technically, yes. But this is a claim that's often talked about uh, in a layperson way, a sounding very cool. It sounds like you're saying this measure predicts what this individual will do in the future, and it does that better than alternatives. What the claim is actually tested as is does this measure predict, uh, uh, sorry, account for additional variance above and beyond that accounted, accommodated for uh, by other measures like self reports? Yes, but this is a bit of a technicality. All, if you add more variables, you almost always predict more variance. Um, so it's reduced a cool claim um, uh, and an ambitious one down to a sort of statistical technicality, in my opinion. But it doesn't matter as long as it supports your uh, talking points. Okay, we're at half an hour now. I might maybe skip some of these. Um, is it predictive of overt behavior? Not just what you say on another self-report task, but action that I take in the world. Now, Curdy et al. say in American Psychologist, a big whopper of a publication, um, I'm sure it was great for Benedict's career um, to get it in there, difficult to do. Um, and he says, 
Debates about whether implicit cognition and behavior are related to one another are unlikely to offer any meaningful conclusions. Um, he then goes on to say, there's no point in estimating a point estimate of what the prediction is, and we would be better off talking about under specific conditions, um, how well does it fare? So again, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of moderators. So the original claim gets watered down um, to become exploratory instead to say, well, even though we're meta-analyzing 20 years of work, let's kind of explore it again. Now, personally, I don't understand why uh, the paper didn't simply include that at point estimate and then um, debate its utility. And perhaps the answer is that the point estimate is, uh, you know, if, you, if I eyeball that confidence interval, it's going to be less than R of 0.1, which isn't a cool result. Um, the prediction interval says that, that the estimate says that it goes anywhere from um, actually negatively related to sort of small, moderate, positive relation. If you cared about the truth of this claim about unique prediction of overt behavior, this might worry you. It might give some nuance that would give you hope about maybe under certain conditions. But that doesn't matter for the, the purposes of this talk. For this talk, we're only going to think about this in, is in the terms of, is this good for the theory? Now we have things to chase. We need to know which moderators tell us when the task is predictive. I know we're 20 something years into doing this. Um, we, I, I'm a co-author on the uh, IAT at 25 years old. So I suppose that's how far we are. But we have, we're, we're faced with the questions that were actually present at the start. Is this predictive and under what conditions? If I cared about truth values, maybe I would say, I feel like we've been spinning our wheels for 25 years. If I cared about the proliferation of a given body of theory, I would say, this is good for the theory. Greenwald et al., the original IIT paper, now has 15,000 citations. Okay, what else could we say? Very briefly, um, Surely all of this is based on a reliable basis, uh, a solid foundation that implicit measures have good uh, reliability. No, even the best ones have very poor test retest reliability. There's very few studies of it, some of them with ends in the sort of 10, 12 and 15 participants. And the R is estimated across multiple domains, which has its own issue to be about 0.3, which if it was a self-report measure, um, people would say it, it, your measure is just not good enough for this sort of use the idea that we could ever get from there to individual level predictions i can tell you just seeing its measurement properties it's not going to happen if i cared about the truth value but this is good for the theory because in fact the repeated claim has been made that it's not merely that the measure is noisy it's that the construct is unstable and now we need to figure out the relative stability of different constructs or um, how it varies, and we can answer more questions. So it's not an undesirable answer, it's a generative question. It's good for the theory. Okay, I'm gonna get a little more specific in this case because it's a multi-site replication study that I've been involved in um, to show you, I suppose, under the hood of what happens a little bit more. Here's another claim, an original talking point, implicit associations, are those, are those that are acquired without awareness of the stimulus pairings. So there's this common um, assumption that when stimuli are merely paired, that they give rise to associations. It's like heavy in learning. Um, Olson and Fazy were the originators of this. Their paper was very good for theory. 800 citations uh, when I checked this morning. Um, published in Psychological Science, great, you know, field leading journal, and um, has since influenced theory and some policy in a variety of different domains, a very impactful theory, very good for the theory. Um, I would say it has a very weak design. Without getting too lost in the weeds, <clears throat> it treats a failed awareness check as the presence of unawareness. So it treats an absence of evidence for awareness as an evidence of absence of unawareness, which I don't think are the same thing because I could fail the attention check because I simply never looked at the procedure or um, I got distracted 
or uh, innumerable other reasons that don't represent the, uh, a guarantee that I observed the stimuli as I was told to do, and I remained unaware to the parents. Okay, the, the broad design, a learning phase. You get a distractor task, you're told, press the space bar every time a specific Pokemon appears on screen. You use Pokemon as a stimuli because at the time in 2003, um, uh, there were so many of them that people were less relatively familiar with. Um, I, I don't know if that changes over time. Um, you press the, the, the space bar every time you see a given Pokemon, and without telling you, the task always uh, presents other stimuli on the screen as well, which you aren't to press space bar to. And some of these always appear together. So there might always be a positively valenced word and a given Pokemon. The awareness check um, that is used to get rid of people who are aware of the pairings is the simple question, did you notice anything unusual during the task? And if you reported in a self-report open-ended format that this Pokemon was always paired with positive stimuli and that Pokemon was always paired with negative stimuli, then you were classified as aware of what was happening in the task and excluded from the analysis because we're only interested in people who acquired uh, an evaluation in the absence of awareness. Now, why I think this is extremely weak is that if I say, uh, yeah, Pokemon were always paired with valence words. Even if I used that technical language, I wouldn't have been excluded because I had to say this Pokemon went with positive and that one went with negative. If I only reported on one of them and said, oh, well, that one always went with positive, I was still not excluded. I had to be fully uh, aware of what was happening in the task, which for the lay person, I think demands an incredible amount from them, especially given that in psychology studies, if you if you have you know if you're an undergraduate in psychology, which so many of these participants are, something unusual within the task could be a man in a monkey suit wandering through the room. So, as in the change blindness experiments, so it is it assumes so much on the behalf of the participant about what constitutes unusual and how I should structure my response. Um, because it's not that unusual to present stimuli and some of them are valenced and some of them get paired. In one sense, that's not that unusual. So should it be any surprise to any of us that when we get rid of, in a very weak way, some of these people, people still, to some small degree, um, say, uh, yeah, this, this Pokemon is better than that Pokemon because you paired him, um, but hadn't technically reported on the pairings. Okay. I won't get too much further lost in the weeds there. The point is, weak study, weak enough that when I polled uh, people working in our field, I couldn't really find um, many supporters of the idea that the effect would likely replicate. Um, the hypothesis being that stimulus pairings would influence evaluation, sorry. And indeed, when my colleagues, uh, Sean and Tal, started meta-analyzing the published literature, what they find is that the, especially the initial studies, which are mostly done by the labs that assert the idea, where all borderline marginal, you know, single digit p-values, um, and as Wolfgang uh, said on Twitter, you know, it feels like these have been nudged. These, these are the actual data of the first few studies, which all come out, but only just about. So what did we do? We replicated them. Um, 12 sites, 1,500 participants, which is about 30 times the original study. Um, and we had four different awareness exclusion criteria, uh, the one that I mentioned before, and then three variations on it. And I've, I've color coded these so that you can see them. Using the original, um, I think quite weak um, exclusion criteria, you still find a very small effect of Hedges G of about 0.1. Under all of the other criteria, you find no evidence of an effect. And using a post hoc uh, compound criteria that basically says uh, exclude people if they were flagged by any criterion, you get no effect and an estimate that is the closest I've ever seen to nothing. Um, G of 0, 0.00 with confidence intervals of 0.1 either side. When it comes to whether this thing is true or not, I'm convinced it's not. That you cannot acquire uh, 
uh, evaluate evaluations while being un, uh, not consciously aware of the pairings. Uh, technically, the original effect replicates, but I would say that there is no evidence for the hypothesis itself. It lacks generalizability because you can't find it under different conditions. It fails more severe tests of the same hypothesis when you use the more severe criterion, and you can define those, the severeness of the criterion empirically. And the effect size is half that in the literature. The usual fare that I'm sure many watchers of this uh, will be used to finding that the effect doesn't replicate or barely replicates and only under some conditions and the effect sizes are tiny. If I cared about truth, this would be, you know, one message. But if I think about what is good for the theory, it's something very different. Even in our paper, which the uh, original authors were given a right of response within our paper, um, they say that it can be interpreted as an unqualified replication of the original study. Total success. In the next paragraph, they say, um, effect sizes are minimally relevant. Who cares? What about the, the publication bias or p-hacking that we, we, we provide evidence of? What about the fact that there's no explanation for why such a highly powered study would give such a reduced effect size unless it was that there was p-hacking of the original studies or publication bias? The key thing, as you'll see in their final line there, Future research must focus on fostering source confusability, whatever that is, um, between the procedural parameters employed here. A beyond, sir. More research necessary. It's good for the theory. We're still talking about it. We have fed this theory with thousands more of participants and dozens of collaborators on this project and hundreds of hours of our collective work. It's good for the theory. I had issues with this, so myself and Sean uh, wrote a reply that, that included that compound criterion. Um, and then uh, Christophe and Olivier um, had their own things to say. So again, it was good for the theory. We're still talking about it. They wrote a reply. And then Benedict and Melissa, they had things to say, and they use a Bayesian perspective a little different from ours. Um, and uh, no one would publish any of them because the journal didn't care. They said, you've all, you were all authors on the original one. Surely you've said all of you can, what you can, despite the fact that there's like a dozen of you or more and you have 1500 words to do it in. Um, so now it's all come together as a single paper. We've had to put all these, these commentaries together and it's still grinding through publication. Um, but it's good for the theory. Look how much we're talking about. It. I might personally, as an individual scientist, be losing my mind, but it's good for the theory. Since we published the replication that shows that it's, depending on how you look at it, clearly not a robust inference about the nature of implicit evaluations or an unqualified uh, replication and success, the paper has been cited 15 more times. Here's the time for the counterfactual. If Ozen, uh, Olson and Fazio had run a high powered, severe test of that hypothesis back in 2001, instead of two studies with 50 something participants each and a weak manipulation and a weak exclusion criterion, they would more than likely have found a, new, a null result because that's what we found. If they had done that, they would not have been published, I do not think, not in the, in the cultural context of 2001 in publishing in psychology. They would not have been published in psych science. This would not have attracted 800 citations since, or the likely hundreds of thousands of dollars in research funding since. This would deny a theory, this theory all that future attention, time, and funding. This probably would be good for us, because I don't believe a word of it in a, in a, in a truth value sense, but it would be extremely bad for the theory. And this is, by definition, a very good theory. So wrapping up on a few of these, what are these key talking points or claims within the implicit cognition literature? Implicit measures, measure unconscious associations, eh, not really. They're uniquely predictive of alert behavior, not really. Uh, they're reliable and valid, it really depends. Moderators, oh, actually it's not a problem because it's the construct, not the measure. They're acquired via unconscious experience, I don't think so, or I do but more research necessary. 
If I cared about truth, if the goal of science was to seek truth, the proximal primary goal, not a goal hidden in there somewhere, I think a lot of these questions could have been answered a decade or so earlier and for a fraction of the budget. But that would be bad for the theory if we think of things not in terms of science as a truth-seeking activity, but as theories, as, uh, as selfish organisms that seek to uh, pull in um, resources which it competes for and claims. And this is the conclusion made by some of the originators, by Greenwald and Banaji and, and Greenwald and Lai. They say that the implicit revolution was a great success. And I think it was, from the theory's perspective, it's a wildly good theory. It's awesome. Why? A good theory is one that survives. It's not good for us necessarily. It's completely agnostic to that. It's good for the theory, not necessarily good for us. Whose fault is this? If you find this to be a bad thing, whose fault is it? No one. There's no individual cynicism or malice needed for this. It is just selection by consequence. I think I forgot to mention on the Farnsworth and Wernstrom slide that these, this is not merely a hypothetical, but two complex simulation studies um, run by two different groups of researchers, both of whom I highly respect, um, simulate the academic publishing context under the conditions of limited resources and differential reinforcement for doing original work versus replications and the potential career impact of failed replications and the like, and find exactly this, that what proliferates in what looked like a good model of our current academic system is the proliferation of theories, not truth. Flawed theories survive better because the environment that they exist within is the current environment. Is it all a crisis? I started by saying it's a, the concept of the invocation of crisis is, a, is an interesting concept. I'm not trying to get even more histrionic by calling it a war, but I think it is an interesting rephrasing. A crisis is a critical juncture where something is to be decided or learned, a pivotal moment. And I don't think that this is a critical juncture in our theorizing, but more so an ongoing war between we who want to use theories to generate answers for us and theories who want to use, want us to use our resources to generate attention, to sustain them, to keep them alive. This is a war between two impulses or between two levels of selection, what we want from a theory and what it wants from us. I think that there is a good chance that I, many times in academia, or at least in my field, subfield of, of, of academic psychology, that the theories are less working for us and more we're, we're working for them. And I think more broadly that we're at serious risk that academia, uh, that academia is of serious risk of becoming a question generating game rather than an answer generating one. If you only have one take home from this talk, I would ask that you see if you can catch this in the wild yourself in your next lab meeting or when discussing papers with a colleague, especially someone senior, see if you can catch in flight as it happens. Um, the, subtle, the subtle cues that what we're talking about in that moment are serving the theory's needs its desire for resources and expansion and continued existence over our needs for useful truth. To generally ask yourself in every moment, qui bono, who benefits from what we're talking about and the way that we're spending our time and, and very limited resources. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Brilliant, Ian, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you ever so much uh, for that. Um, so, uh, anybody who wants to ask uh, a question, they may do so by just, you know, raising their hands and, and unmuting if they like, or if they prefer, they can uh, just enter in the conversation window. Um, whilst people just ruminate on the talk and formulate a question, 
Uh, oh, we already have them anyway. OK, so I was going to give in a filler emergency question then. So I can see Talia is typing in the chat, so I'll wait for her. Antonio, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah. sorry. Um, so Ian, first of all, this, <laughs> this was brilliant. I mean, I, I was already expecting something truly awesome, but this exceeded my expectations, so thank you. Um, so you mentioned the fact that plot theories survive better because of the, envir because of the environment they exist within. Um, and I find it like a very interesting uh, take. So suppose you were an enlightened dictator and you could change the environment. And now we're talking about, yeah, for example, the academic environment um, that might be conducive uh, for this kind of theories to proliferate. What would you change first? What would you do first? I should have expected that you'd want me to solve all this. It's much easier to put down issues than solve them. Um, I think that I've had two broad thoughts about this. First, in many areas of industry and business, um, people are remunerated and congratulated, whether they're, they're reinforced, whether monetarily or career-wise or what have you, not by... Uh, merely increasing sales or revenue, which is kind of like producing more theories, more papers and spending more money, but sometimes by the money that they save. If you can go into an organization and say, I just saved you, you know, half a million a year on some service that you've been overpaying for or an inefficiency in your process, you get rewarded for that. So I don't know about the specifics, but I currently see no mechanism like that in uh, academia. It's a yes and context, like improv. There's only reinforcement, you know, every citation. If I were to reply to your paper and I say it's complete rubbish, it's still a citation of your paper and it helps your H index. Whereas if there was some mechanism that said, um, people seem to be very invested in a given area of research, I have provided really strong critique that says this work is not worth pursuing my implicit contribution to the field is to save, and you can put some estimate on that, to say uh, the following grants don't need to be awarded or the following area of research should be, you know, put on a, this is a far higher risk activity. Again, you would need to figure out, you know, the details of that, but instead of being weighed, not only on my productions, but on squaring out areas to say they are not worth pursuing. And to some degree, academia needs a discard mechanism, which I mean, Popper has been, you know, is at the core of his. It's not about being right, it's about discarding what's wrong. Now, I'm not a Popperian, but it's a core concept in there that we have, we, we teach undergrads all the time to read more uh, Popper, but we don't uh, embody it ourselves. We don't say, you, great, you will be rewarded, you will get a position because you save the field uh, by proving and it nip, nipping a subject in the bud earlier on to say that should not be pursued. You've saved society 20 years and, you know, 2 million euro worth of funding and, and endless amounts of promises and the rest of it until we have reinforcement for saving us from going down wrong paths. Um, I, I don't know, without punishment mechanisms like that, um, how we can do it. The other one is a, a much more micro level. Um, strategy, which is, uh, and this is a pretty raw idea, so, you know, forgive me if it's kind of real 2 a.m. stuff, but <clears throat> um, having done some of a um, uh, Google Analytics uh, course, um, they introduce at one stage this this concept, which is used in business apparently, um, and it's, it's not a literal claim, but a useful orientating device called the five whys. So if I want to know What's the system? What's the, the ultimate cause of a, a problem? I want to ask why at least five times is the general idea. Uh, it's not a scientific idea, it's just a useful business one to say, uh, why does the car not? What's the problem? The car won't start. Why not? Well, the alternator is broken. Why? There's rust on the, um, the, the uh, what do you call it? Not a car guy, the belt. Um, why? Because it wasn't, um, it didn't come in for its you know, uh, thousand mile service. 
lie because we forgot to send out the text to remind people. So you, you get it closer and closer to ultimate uh, calls that have most useful generality. I think that we should be doing the opposite uh, when it comes to um, scientific research that says, don't just tell me what the implications of, a, of this are. I'm going to press you multiple times. Then what? Oh, well, it might be that, um, that racist behavior is caused by a history of like stimulus pairings. Then what? Well, we would need to intervene on those pairings or change them in the world. Then what? How would I get people who, who aren't, am I, am I going to mandate stimulus pairings in the morning um, for people? Like, is that politically access, acceptable? Or then what? Okay, imagine you're right. Um, who do you call? Is it someone in the civil service? Is it, you know, how do you communicate this beyond a journal article? And I think that I have not yet met, despite working in, 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 um, in some more applied fields, suicide is a little better on this front. Um, but many academics, when you press them, who initially seem almost euphoric about the potential of their work, can't withstand more than two or three, then what would you do? If you were right, what would you do? Because we're unprepared, to, it's, not, it's not within our ken to think about it. We're, we're so focused on the questions. That's what we love. We're, we're enticed by the questions. And that would, would this be cool if we could do some work on this? But like the dog catching the postman or catching the, the car that he's chasing the wheel of, if you caught it, you would not know what to do with it. Who would you call? If it turns out you had the answer to what mental process mediates whatever behavior, then what? Apart from just more questions. So yeah, broad structural punishment mechanisms and an individual level push to require people to say, if you were right, what the hell would you do with it? In very specific terms. Antonio, you have your hand up again. Is, uh, do you have a response? I don't have a response, but I, I don't. I, like, I, I have I have a follow up question, but I don't want to monopolize the Q and A. No, that's fine. I, one thing I'll just flag is that Talia. So two things that Talia said. She said. Uh, uh, thank you, Ian and Sam. Very interesting talk coming from qual and theoretical social psych. I am working on uh, hegemic, hegemonic, sorry, uh, social representations in everyday thinking, but I can relate to what you have presented as an example of ongoing cultural hegemonies um, in our field. And then she did say that she she's got intermittent sound, so hopefully I could hear you fine, but uh, hopefully that is not bad news for the recording. But yeah, Antonio, do you want to reply to, um, to I, I would just say quickly that yeah. uh, it's a lot of willpower to not say the word hegemony over and over again, because yeah. that is something that uh, myself and Jamie Cummins a year or two would, would find. It was everywhere. I would love to have a conversation with you uh, more about that. Yeah. It was a, a fascinating point to raise. It is. It is. It's an instance of hegemony at every turn. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Antonio, do you want to fire away your question? Yeah, because at some point you mentioned something that really, yeah, that, that, that caught my attention. So you, uh, if I understand correctly, um, you don't think that within the academic environment we would be able to find it in ourselves to basically steer in a way from, um, from this way of thinking. So this, this, this way of caring about you know more and more questions to generate rather than finding uh, answers to the um, uh, to the questions so my question to you is if i answer correctly of course but does that if that's the case does that mean that you think that we need like agents external to academia who help us figure out or regulate a bit um ourselves i think that nothing happens in a cultural context and we already have some degree of external uh, oversight uh, based on what society is willing to tolerate as a legitimate question or not um, but i think academia has also gone to some lengths to insulate itself from it um, there are some areas of work that do great like for example patient and participant involvement um, but generally, I think most of society has no idea what the average psychologist is doing, or is it comforted by the idea that uh, 
we're doing smart stuff and should be left to it. Um, so I suppose what I'm saying is I don't think we are currently absent of that, but I do think it's interesting to wonder um, if the man on the Clapham omnibus, if you're aware of the concept, uh, was able to interrogate the average psychologist about the specifics of what they're doing. Like, for example, if I presented some of the work on implicit measures uh, to an intelligent but otherwise unaware uh, person, I think uh, that she might ask, why wasn't a lot of this work done years ago? Why was it done in this order? Um, or maybe is that all you have to show for this? Is there really only half a dozen good prospective prediction studies? Like, why was anyone allowed to talk about this work uh, that it could have these implications for 20 years? Why didn't you collect data on it and see if you could and then kind of talk about it? Um, so, yes, I think that daylight is good. I have no idea whether that is grassroots um, citizen involvement style daylight or more centralized um, oversight. I'm aware of anything that ends up just being more KPIs because I mean academics will you know find a way to game those stats too. I don't know. I'm you know maybe this is uh, a symptom of my you know better at pointing out problems than solutions. I'm not sure. Uh, well, I mean, we can carry on. I mean, uh, maybe we can call time soon. I, I mean, I do have a couple of questions. So I don't know whether, Antonio, you you wanted to respond to it. It seems to be um, an interesting question. I wanted to sort of play devil's advocate for just a second and and just say that you focus a lot on the implicit associate, implicit bias. I mean, in, in many ways, it's an unusual beast, the implicit association, because it seems to have sort of caught the public imagination and and really became quite a of a considerable focus and discussion at just <coughs> the right sort of context for a theory to be sort of in the homes of many people. Most of the time, though, in psychological theories, they don't really go beyond the campus. Um, so are you would you not to appear unkind and really play devil's advocate but do you think that your point is not really the it loses its sting in a sense because it's only really associated with the implicit association test most of the theories will find a sort of fizzle out over time and don't really cause that much of an impact and disrupt people's lives and cause the kind of societal issues uh, in terms of where do we apply funding, what do we do with policies and, and all this kind of stuff. So I guess my question is, you know, is it just one of those cases where, you know, why do psychologists argue so much because the stakes are so low? <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. so, you know what I mean? It, it's so. Yeah, yeah. There's okay, a lot so I would appeal back again to the fact that it's the 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 simulation studies, um, which represent, mm -hmm. I think, academia as a whole, by Smaldino Macquarie, and, and um, I forgive me, I've forgotten the second the, the, the author of the other paper, um, somewhere in the Netherlands. Uh, both of those apply uh, speak to the conditions of academic psychology and academia generally, mm -hmm. and they are the ones that I draw the inferences from here about what survives and what doesn't. And I happen to use one illustration, which you might find not to be representative, but the illustration doesn't, doesn't, isn't there to prove the argument, it's to illustrate an instance of the argument. So even if you say, well, implicit bias literature is weird, I say, fine, go and read the simulation studies because they are more generic. Yeah. Second, yeah. I would say it's fascinating if a genuine reply to this is, well, I don't think there's much of a problem because the thing you talked about is successful and most theories are completely unsuccessful in that they never leave the college campus. And that means things are going well. If we are protected from the downsides of this by our own failure to get anything outside of the lab, that's an even bigger issue. 
Um, I think that so many other fields have a closely aligned technology that work stops in the lab or, or it bifurcates into to, part of it goes off into the world because you start doing stuff with it. You do something with chemical sciences, you walk, go off and start building transistors or better concrete for bridges or whatever it might be, um, or some new biotechnology thing, you can do something within the world. Um, psychology, more than most academic professions, I think lacks an, align, an allied technological wing. And I think that's a massive failure of ours. So we start looking at these weird proxies, like does it reach the public consciousness? Is there a coffee table books written on this? Um, do people generally chit chat about this around the water cooler instead of um, like, is it used in policy? Um, which some things are, you know, I'm not saying mm -hmm. this is not a, a, a single paintbrush I want to paint all of psych research with. There is, there is better work out there. It's just that the, the better it is, the less psychological it tends to be. It tends to focus more on structures and less on individuals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Right. Very good. I mean, Talia has just joined us again. And I know that she made the point earlier about the um, the uh, hege enemies uh, or hegemonies. Uh, so I don't know whether you wanted to sort of open that up for a conversation, although I know that we're kind of over time but i just do wanted to sort of ask uh, something which you only require a, a brief answer uh, obviously tell Yarconi is is sort of qu quite at the forefront of sort of building theories in the well he's written the paper on the generalizability crisis and his earlier work which i'm particularly a, a fan of is sort of this idea of prioritizing prediction and he seems to be quite good at at sort of removing the round the ground around this sort of very elastic theory that people can just constantly change with the, the changing wind and he i wonder if there is a potential solution in say his prediction paper where i don't know what that would look like but whether it's a cultural shift or more of a top-down structural ch shift where we we, we must normalize and, and come to expect very uh you know theories that that are, are verbalized and written down in a very sort of predictive style where instead of just trying to retrospectively explain findings which seems to be the case with the work you've discussed with the implicit bias it's more a case of what you would predict and those predictions are spelt out in clear terms and testable terms you know whether is there any way to reward or incentivize that if if it is indeed a good way to avoid this constant um, you know, uh, keeping theories on life support and keeping them going? I think the short answer might be something like, I think there are all sorts of areas in which that already occurs. And Tal's paper uh, was very focused on, I mean, he, you know, he appealed to machine learning a lot there, where he says, not only should we be focused on predictions, but we shouldn't care about how we got to those predictions. The models wouldn't even have to uh, have correspondence what what we think the mental mechanisms are or the social mechanisms. All that matters is that you are accurate. Now, there's all sorts of fields of computer science and machine learning that already do this stuff. We need to recognize that we are not merely talking about what are good theories, in, even in the truth sense, but good theories that fit within the paradigm of psychology. And there are all sorts of things that that paradigm will reject as being insufficiently theoretical. If you can't appeal to mind brain process mechanism, mostly psychology doesn't care because it starts to look too much like mere prediction categorization machine learning, or you start describing structures too much. Um, um, and it starts to look like not psychology. So I think we always have to bear in mind that we are not merely being asked for a solution here, because they already exist elsewhere, but a solution that is acceptable to still label as psychology, because so many of these things are baked in, that if you stopped doing some of these things, it would be more useful to stuff in the world, but it's no longer psychology. And then the, the big theory, the biggest sort of category label of all is um, that you're no longer doing psychology. And that living, breathing organism is trying to survive all the time it demands a continued existence. Mm. Um, and if, you, if, if that point is too vague, I would encourage anyone to try and publish a paper 
that um, merely makes good predictions or says, uh, it turns out this thing is really associated with that thing. And we are utterly agnostic to what a mind brain process mechanism is involved um, and see how difficult that is. I have repeated experience of that as a radical behaviorist who I don't care about the mind. Um, I don't care about cognition in one sense. Um, and you will get rejected over and over from these journals. I had a Panas paper rejected only a while ago because they said uh, it was on deep faking and evaluative learning. And people said in the reviews, someone said, uh, I work in government and this is really relevant to security and, and people need to read this. Uh, but also you don't say anything about, uh, you know, what the cognitive representations are here. So reject. It doesn't matter that it's useful. It has to serve the uh, ongoing perpetuation of the enterprise that is the study of the human mind. Mm. Um, and, and though they are in that order, first, it has to serve psycho psychology's needs. And second, within that, it has to be hopefully, or maybe we could search for something useful, but never the other way around. You couldn't have something that is raw, predictive or influence utility. For example, like within ICO's uh, series of replies and, and target articles in Psych Inquiry, I thought it was fascinating that like one of the one of the things he says and some of the other authors keep coming back to is that it's about description, prediction, and influence of behavior. Mm -hmm. That is, though that description of what the point of theory is is what Skinner described, but we reject Skinnerianism right. <laughs> as not useful or overly simplistic because it doesn't tell the psychological story that we all want. We don't actually want something that predicts and influences well. We want to know cool stuff about the mind brain. Yeah. Well, that's really depressing. So, because, uh, yeah, so I'm, um, Antonio has sort of listed a few authors in the, in the, com uh, so uh, that, that, that have contributed to sort of theory building. And Olivia Guest was kind enough to give a talk for us. Uh, a few months ago now on on her really really nice paper of, of, of building theories in sort of computational modeling um it's just a pity that can't be sort of widely adopted and i guess as you've said there's powerful incentives to, to to not make it more normal um so i mean i think i must go at half past so unfortunately so i'm going to stop the recording but um Thank you very much, Ian, for your uh, wonderful talk and really engaging Q and A. And thanks for staying on afterwards. Um, I'm just. Gonna, uh, thank you. Um, okay.